John, and if you'll find John chapter 1, and uh, we'll start there, and then we're going to go over to 1 Samuel and just skim through a bunch of 1 Samuel. So if you get to John 1 real fast, uh, you can jump over to 1 Samuel 13. We'll be there in a moment. I want to encourage you to be in church. Um, being, I know you're in church. Most of you are here this morning. Um, but I'd like to encourage you to be in Sunday school. Uh, can you get too much Bible? Can your kids get too much of God and his word? No way. Uh, get back on Wednesday night. And some of you, uh, I know your work schedules uh, control you. But um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't let work keep me from church too much. Um, you know, and I, and you, you've got to make that decision. But, if, but I, I know this, the devil would love to have you out of church. And, and like you're going to see tonight, there is a progress or a degress. And you will either grow in grace and, and mature and, and find more of God and his blessings, or you're going to go the other direction. And this talking about you that are, I don't care if you're 12 years old or 50 years old, um, the odds are you're going one direction or another. And as, you, as a pastor, um, you know, I've been here all these years, I want to grow. I, the last thing I want to do is coast. Coasting is always downhill. And, uh, you know, the, to me, you know, this, my kids are gone. Praise the Lord. Now I can just focus on me and my wife and God and, and you know, and then all the things that don't work on me anymore. <laughs> but uh, uh, grow grow be in church and uh, really really want to encourage you get in get into uh, get our kids in sunday school parents get you into an adult class and um and then get back wednesday night well, this wednesday we're starting a series on the tabernacle I've never done this before and um I'm, i've always been a little concerned about i don't want church to be boring and that not that anything of god is boring but you know you've read the exodus and leviticus and um so um, we're going to do something different. We've never done like this before. Uh, this Wednesday, I'm going to introduce, we're going to use a lot of pictures, and I'm just going to introduce the tabernacle. And then uh, the following week, um, someone else, I'll, I'll open the, the Bible study, and someone's going to teach on a section of it, and then someone else is going to teach. And so we're going to have eight different people or nine different people teaching on different facets of the tabernacle and uh, keep it fresh, and we'll have pictures, and and we're going time traveling back, getting pictures of the real thing. And so anyway, that'll be good. All right, so come on Wednesdays. And the kids, uh, Wednesday night, all the kids, uh, the kids need Wednesday night kids class. That is great. All right, let's stand. John chapter 1, look at verse 7. We're talking about light tonight, light and darkness. John chapter 1. And if you look at verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came as a, you know, there was a what sent from God? And that's something. You know there are men, amen? And you know you can read the whole Bible through. You're only going to find men and women. There you go. All right. Okay, just so you know. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And the same, this same man, John, came for a witness to bear witness of the light, capital L, that all men through, what's the next word? So that light is a him. We all good with that? Oh, that all men through him might believe. He, capital H, that's the light. He was not, he, no, I'm sorry, that's John. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So we got John in there, and then we got the light that's a he. That was the true light, capital L again, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, he, that light, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, his own received him not, but... As many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The light that he, uh, if we'll believe on his name, we can be, become the sons of God. Let's pray. Help us, Lord, as we look at your book tonight. Thank you for the church. Thank you for the great last five days and for all the work. And uh, we believe not only that we were a help to people, but we believe that you bless your workers and you sent us to represent you and we we tried we wanted to represent you well and uh, if we'd have worked at a mcdonald's or a grocery store we'd have worked at a any kind of a store the the uh, 
the owners with integrity would have paid their employees and and I believe we're going to be to heaven one day and I'm going to get to see your people rewarded for their faithfulness thank you thank you for being a faithful God and and a God who who looks after your people bless us in Jesus name amen you can be seated in John 1 there's light in verse 7 this light was that all men through him might believe and verse 8 that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world we have a savior who is literally represented by light he is spoken of as if he was light and of course he brought light into the world and uh, so the light in john 1 is jesus the the very person of christ is the light that came into the world if you go back up to verse 5 you'll notice that the light shineth in the darkness in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not so not only do we have light we have darkness and we're in a culture today that is trying so hard to reverse them satan has always been in the mixing it up world satan loves to twist things and confuse things and um, woe to the people the prophet wrote that call dark light and light dark and evil good and good evil that mixing up of things and that's that's our whole culture today you, you cannot allow yourself parents of children um, you and if you're a parent and of not children and I'm concerned what you're a parent of but you you just gotta you've got to shut the TV off I mean cartoons sensuous indiscreet inappropriate um, from vocabulary to stance and and ladies if your husband thinks something is indiscreet, trust him. Always err to the right. And guys, if your wife thinks something is not appropriate, err to the right. I might think it's not that big a deal. My wife thinks it is a big deal. Then we're making a big deal of it. My wife says, I don't get it. I don't get it. And I say, well, I'm a man and, I, and I'm telling you. All right. And not, not a man that I'm the Lord. I'm a man. Men think differently than women. Men, women, men, women. All month long, men, women. <laughs> and 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 we don't think men don't think like women and um and we won't even go there never mind i got too much sermon and we've already had a we, some of our workers are ready to go home and go to bed but uh, but this the the devil would love to twist things and and he'd love to have somebody who tries to stand for holiness and righteousness be made to look bad and love to make someone who's totally corrupt look good that's the work of the devil. And, and so in our home, and I'm seriously with my wife and I, there were times she'd say, you know, I don't feel real comfortable about that person one of the kids is hanging around with. I go with her, her call. I just do. And if I felt strongly about something she didn't, then she'd trust my call. Because we're not going to error, we're not going to do anything wrong going to the right a little extra. The trouble we're going to have is going to the left. The trouble we're going to have is lowering the standard. And, and, and so we, and we did. We differed as, as, as we're going to. We're humans and, and we see things differently. But, but all the, the television, parents, the things that your kids are seeing, the video, the YouTube, all this stuff. And you college students, you have way, 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 way too much freedom. And, and yes, I mean college students, you have too much freedom. Just because you're out of high school, I was out of high school not long ago, and I can tell you, being out of college doesn't mean you have this instant discernment and you won't look anything wrong. You're crazy. You're crazy. And uh, you, you just cannot do it. You need to make, your, you need to make your, your, your cyber world, your technical world so clean and so separated because we're in a filthy world. And it is movies, and it is Hollywood, and it is the music industry, but it's all this other junk that comes on. And whether it be podcasts or, or Instagram or whatever, let's just decide we're going to be clean. And, and you that are rearing children, decide you're going to be in control of what gets in your kid's head. Once they're out of your house, there's nothing you can do about it. Then you young people, I, I love the, the young man who years ago, he was in college, and 
And I called him or something, and he said, well, he, I was going to send him a text. He said, can't send me a text. I, I got rid of my phone. He said, the phone I've got doesn't text. I said, okay. I knew what he did because he and I talked some time before, and, and the decision was made. We just talked about it, and I said, if I was concerned about what was getting into my head, the very next time any garbage was on that device, I'd bust it and throw it away. And I didn't have to ask. He'd gotten rid of his, he'd gotten rid of his phone. He said, why would you do that? Because you love your brain. You want your head and your heart clean. And he had this dorky, stupid phone that wouldn't do anything. It would not put any smut into his head. And uh, that's a very smart way to live, by the way. So light, light, there is light and there is darkness. Go over to John chapter 11, just a few pages over John chapter 11. And I want you to notice Jesus is talking about light and darkness. And he does it on, on several occasions. John chapter 11. And we're just going to jump down to verse 9. John chapter 11, verse 9. Uh, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If a man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of the world. See, when you see light, you're not going to stumble. When you're walking in the light, you see things. You know what's going on. But look at verse 10. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. And we need to understand that it is very possible for you as a child of God to walk in the darkness and begin to stumble into things that you had no intention of stumbling over. But because you got into the night, you ended up in a place, in a situation that was dark, and you're not able to see. Remember, it's a good example of this in Proverbs 7. Solomon looks out, he said, at the window of my casement, I looked through my house and beheld among the simple ones, a young man, and, and I discerned among the simple ones, a young man, and he said, he, he saw him in the twilight, and then he saw him in the evening, and then he saw him in the black and the dark night. See, that young man first started wandering around in the evening. And then as it got the sun set, it was the twilight, and then it was dark, and then it was the dark, dark, no light anywhere. And there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. See, his problem was it was getting dark. And he didn't stay in the light. And he was in the wrong place as he went through. He went the way to her corner. He was drifting. He knew, you guys, you know. You know on, on digitally, or you know online, you know in the technical world, you know where you're drifting. If, if you're saved, if you read your Bible at all, God, God, God puts the warning signs up there. And if you refuse those warnings, you're going to end up darker and darker. Have you not, have, have we all, all of us, we've seen people in situations think, how could somebody end up there? One step at a time. John chapter 12, go over a page. John chapter 12, look at verse 35. John 12, verse 35. Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from. You know, there's a decision of what walk you're going to have. You're going to walk in the light. You're going to walk in the dark. You're going to walk in the day. You're going to walk in the night. You're going to walk in the light. You know, in Psalm 119, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. This word is our light. Over in Proverbs 4, we don't have time to turn there, but in Proverbs 4:18, it says the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. Chapter 4, verse 18. That means I'm in the light today. But as I stay in the path of justice, the path of just is as a shining light. And it says it shineth more and more. Every step I take on the right path, the light gets brighter. And the light gets brighter. And the light gets brighter. See, back here, I may, I may just have a little night light and just kind of working my way through life, being not sure what's right and what's wrong. And I go a little bit further. And, and God says, you know what? If you're willing to walk in the light, I'm going to give you some more amperage. Watch. 
Then we go to a little 40 watt bulb and then pretty soon I got an 80 watt bulb and then we got these 250 watt Halligan floodlights and I can see everything that's going on. And I'll just say this, sometimes your parents, pastors, spiritual leaders might say, that's not a good place, that's not a good situation. And you're gonna say, I don't see it because you're back here with a nightlight. But they've been walking in the light long enough, they've got a floodlight going and they see more and they have more light than you do. Have enough sense. I have lived my ministry listening to old people. And you know that's the case. I've talked about it through all these years. My, I believe there's somebody down the road that knows more than me and I want it. Now the problem is now most of them are down the road in the Wildemar Cemetery. <laughs> Oh, so now, thank God for the internet. I listen to old dead guys all the time. On the, on, on, you, I'm just coming down here to church this evening. I was listening to a preacher. He's up in heaven. And I'm thinking, man, thank God for technology. I can listen to pre. He being dead, yet speaketh, Hebrews says. Now, look over to 1 Samuel. We've got a lot of territory to cover and not much time to cover it. But uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13. Now, in my Bible... Um, if you've been around me much and seen my Bibles, they're all marked up. And some of it is for preacher's sake, but some of it is for me. Um, I, I color, I color, started right away after I got saved, I started coloring my Bible. Any verse that's a promise, I color yellow. And so maybe um, I'm having a difficult time. I just thumb through my Bible and read all the yellow verses. Promise after promise after promise after promise. And all different, uh, some of it's doctrinal, deity of Christ and heaven, hell, things like that. Then I use, I use margin notes and BZ is for liquor and thumb through my Bible, look for BZ and those are all booze verses and, and just things that help me find verses because I'm not that smart, but I'm smart enough to mark up my Bible. With King Saul, you'll see through my Bible the word Saul and an arrow down or an arrow up. And Saul's life started when he was little in his own eyes and so over and over in the first chapters of Saul's life, it says Saul and arrow up, Saul and arrow up. And one of my Bibles actually wrote what he did right, but it's pretty obvious if you read the scripture. I'm going to take you through some of these arrows down. How did Saul find himself rejected? How did he go from a man chosen to a man literally kicked out and killed and he cost his son his son's life? How did, how did he get there? All right, let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 13. Now, if you're not familiar with the life of Saul, I apologize, but we can't read all of 1 Samuel before in and out closes, okay? So I'm going to pull stories out. This is a very readable thing. Parents, you ought to read Samuel and Kings pretty much as easy reading for your children. And uh, you say, I can't get my children to sit still while I read. Well, beat them. Uh, I mean, feed them, feed them, feed them. <laughs> I read the Bible during breakfast time. I didn't say beat, I said feed. <laughs> First Samuel 13, um, verse three. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. Who smote the garrison of the Philistines? Is there any question about that? No, all right. Jonathan and Saul blew the trumpet. Now, Jonathan is Saul's son. Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land saying, let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines. Hmm. You know what? He's a liar. He's stealing the credit. He's a glory hog. He... Anyway, that's the first Saul arrow down in my Bible. There might have been others before, but that's the first one in my Bible. Go over, uh, go over to chapter 13, verse 12. <clears throat> or verse 11, Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because he was supposed to have killed all these people, and he, he didn't. And um, Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not. He was supposed to be waiting for the preacher to come to have sacrifice and things, and he didn't, he didn't do it. And he said, I, in verse 11, and Saul said, because I saw the people were scattered from me, it's their fault, I'm blaming the people. And thou camest not within the days appointed, it's your fault. You're going to see that over and over. Blaming the people, blaming the, the man of God. And uh, thou camest not within the days that the Philistines were gathered together themselves together at Mishmash. Therefore said I, 
the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I've not made supplication to the Lord, and I forced myself. I didn't want to do it, but I had to do it. Saul, arrow down. He offered a burnt offering that he was not supposed to offer. If you look, go over just a couple of pages to chapter 15. Chapter 15, again, Samuel is the preacher who anointed Saul. He's the one who'd led the nation until the nation said, we want a king to be like other nations. You know, the very idea, if we, if we had stayed a Bible reading people, we would not have allowed metrics into America. Say, so what's that got to do with anything? Because if we were familiar with the Bible, the reason that Israel fell, they said, we want to be like all the other nations. And God said, I want my people to be different. Throw out metric. You say, well, it's easier to figure out than inches and feet. I know. But God's ways are not easier. They're right. <laughs> but there's all, it's, it's the motive. It's not about the, it's not about the system of measure. It's we shouldn't want to be like the world. The world's a mess. What do we want to be? Like Germany? We want to be like England? We want to be like France? The only thing good out of France is French fries. I don't know anything good out of France, but uh, who, who do we want? You know what? Everybody wants to be like us, and we're busy trying to be like them. We're crazy. It's a bunch of bible people saying, why can't we be like everybody else? Because they're all a wreck. That's why. Makes sense. So, chapter 15. Um, Samuel's the preacher, still around. And again, we're jumping into the story. And uh, Saul was supposed to kill these guys and different things go on. But uh, look at verse 9. I apologize if you don't know the story. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs. All that was good would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse that they destroyed. Now they had a command to kill all the animals and get rid of the king and said, this is their enemy. And, and they saved everything that looked good and they got rid of everything that looked bad. Do you know God doesn't want your opinion on what's good and bad? You want to know how Saul got from being the chosen to the rejected? He started thinking his opinion was better than God's opinion. And you'll see in a couple of minutes, this is how nations get into darkness. How, how does a nation get so far down as the Bataan Death March? If you've never read about it, don't read it to your children. How vile. Things, things I could never read in public or even talk about in public. The Japanese did to our prisoner of war. Horrible, filthy, shameful, beyond words. How do people get there? How do people get where Hitler was? And one of the last things I did in our junior senior philosophy class, I showed a very, very light version of Auschwitz and Dachau, the two of the main prison camps in Germany where they kept the Jews and some, not just Jews, but a lot, a lot of Jews. And, and it would be good. You, you, I censored them very, very censored, but you parents wouldn't hurt at all. Teach your kids. Teach your kids about the evil of humanity where they skin people and make lampshades out of their skin just because they're Jews. And it gets really gross beyond that. The evil and the vile. How do they get so dark? How do they get so dark? I tell you, one of the things, they start trying to make themselves look good and taking glory. That's where Saul started down. And then they go along, and, and where Saul is here, he started thinking his opinion was more important than the opinion of God. And if God says it's so, it's so. It doesn't matter what every church in America says. If God says it, it's so. And we better understand that the government's wrong and God's right. And if the church differs with God, the church is wrong and God is right. And your feelings, someone says, well, you just don't understand how I feel. I understand your feelings are wrong. Well, you know what? I just feel like, well, you know what? You stop it. Stop it. You might not understand farm life, but when... When you get a dog going into the chicken pen, sucking egg, they call them egg sucking dogs. None of you know about farm, you know you're farmers. But there are dogs who get lichen eggs. 
And they'll get into the chicken house and they'll get in there and just bite the egg, suck that egg right out. And you have these broken eggshells and no egg in it. There's only one thing you can do to an egg sucking dog. I'm not going to say it, but anyway, because there's too many warm and fuzzy people here. <laughs> this little boy, this little boy, he, uh, he just loved his dog. And he came home one day and he came home and his, his dad's a preacher and, he, and the, they all, everybody's in bed and the boy calls his dad. His dad's, what's wrong with my kid? And goes in the room and the boy says, dad, dog's going to be in heaven. Dad says, nope. He said, then I don't want to go. Dad said, it's up to you. Went back to bed. That's the way to handle it, by the way. About a half hour later, the boy said, Dad. Dad gets up, walks in, what you need? He said, I've just been thinking. <laughs> said, what are you thinking about? I just, well, get it over with. He got out of bed, got on his knees, and got saved. <laughs> It has nothing to do with the sermon, but it's a great story. It's a great, great story. Look over. Saul, Saul just did what he thought was best. And God says, I'm done with him in verse 11 and 12. And Samuel cried all night, but he loved Saul and he cared about Saul. Look at verse 15. And verse 15. And, and Saul said, uh, um, well, you got to read the story to know all this. He, Saul said earlier, he said, I've done everything you asked me to do. And verse 14, Samuel said, what meaneth the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the ox which I hear? They're all supposed to be dead. What are they doing still bleeding and lowing? And Samuel said, look at this in verse 15. And Saul, and Saul said, they brought them. Always pointing the finger. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. They brought them from the Amalekites for the people <clears throat> spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice the Lord because they're really good people, Samuel. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Don't blame people. Stop it. Just stop it. Look over at verse 30, chapter 15, verse 30. Then he said, so Samuel says, I'm done with you. God's done with you. Samuel's walking away. And Saul grabs Samuel and says, wait, 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 wait. Look at verse 30. He said, I've sinned. Yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel. Turn again that I may worship. You know, he said, Samuel says, I'm done with you. And Saul says, well, okay, if you're done with it, it's okay, but, but would you just make me look real good here? Would you just kneel with me in front of everybody like we're big buddies and we're praying together here? And this is, that's another arrow down on Saul. You just follow this guy's life. He is trusting in himself, worried about how good he looks. Honor me, make me look good, treat me good, take good care of me. And all oh, the stories, it just, just goes on and on. Remember, David's not even in the story yet, the next king. David's not even come in and killed Goliath. We're going to go to chapter 18. <clears throat> chapter 18. God, uh, Saul brings David in to play an instrument to do to to help in different things but but uh let, you know the story david kills goliath and the big battle follows and and uh, david's coming back into town and and the women are singing saul hath slain his thousands and david is ten thousands that doesn't do much for a man's ego look at verse 7 in the chapter 18 verse 7 the women answered one another as they played saying saul hath slain his thousands and david is ten thousand and saul was very wroth and the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousand to, to me, have they ascribed it thousands. What can he have more with the kingdom? Insecure, crybaby, blaming others. Why didn't he go kill Goliath? Verse 9, And Saul eyed David from that day forward, and it came to pass in the morrow, an evil spirit from God came upon him, upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall. Now, you understand this. We now have a spiritual entity, an evil spirit, troubling Saul. See what happens in our culture, we don't start work with things till we get way down here in this evil. What we should work on is way back up here. The self-will, the blame, the finger-pointing, 
to make me look good. It's all about me. I know God says that, but this is what I think. There's no evil spirit here yet. It's just, that's just mankind. Men are bad. Children go astray from the womb. That's what God said. Doesn't matter what the psychologist said. By nature, we are by nature the children of wrath. And so Saul's one step after another, but now we got a spiritual problem. And it's a deep spiritual problem. Let's hurry through here. This thing could go on for a long time. This, this story, you ought, to, you ought to, especially you young men thinking of, of being in leadership in a business, but, but in the ministry for sure, you ought to know this story inside and out. Um, let's just skip over a few. Go over to chapter 19. Chapter 19, and, and you find Saul has told his staff, go kill David. He just, just decided the only way to get rid of this guy is to kill David. Chapter 19, verse 1, Saul spake to Jonathan his son, to all his servants, that they should kill David. Another step down, tells more about that. Verse, uh, verse they, he, uh, he sends people to, to, kill David, to get David from his house, to bring him and kill him. And Michael is, is Saul's daughter that David married, and, and she, she gets David out and puts, uh, puts uh, stuff in the bed so it looks like he's in bed and covered up. She said, he's sick, he can't come. So they go tell Saul, and Saul sends him back. Well, bring him in his bed, bring him sick. So that's where we are in verse 13. And Michael took an image and laid it in bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for a bolster and covered it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, he said, he's sick. And Saul sent the messengers, I'm in verse 15, again uh, to David saying, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. Of course, he wasn't there. And boy, did Saul get mad about that. Hey, go back to verse 9. Verse 9, an evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul. And David, again, got his javelin thrown at him. Go over to chapter 20, down at verse 30. Chapter 20, verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. Jonathan was trying to defend David and say he's a good man. He's done nothing wrong. By the way, when you start trying to destroy people who've done nothing but help you, you are demonic. When, when you see a spirit of destruction, a, an, an evil spirit of trying to destroy those who've done nothing but help, whether it be the country or the, or the whatever, that's evil beyond words. And that's what you're looking at here. It is this spiritual decline, this evil spirit troubling Saul, and he's getting darker and darker, and, he, and he's walking in darkness. And this, this story is getting, and now... It's his own son. Look how evil. Look at verse 30. Chapter 20, verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. That's his son. And he said unto him, Thou son of a perverse, rebellious woman. I think that's a cuss word. <laughs> now he's cursing Jonathan and his mama. Hey, you don't, you don't get that far in your home without going down some pretty bad steps. And if that kind of vocabulary and the colloquialisms of the gutter are entering into your marriage, you've got a severe spiritual problem. And you better decide, I am going to turn to God and beg his mercy and try if in his mercy he would pull me out of this darkness. Because the light is growing dim and you will find yourself in darkness so dark and you won't even know what you're stumbling over. You, you see people, they're falling into things. They're getting into trouble and they're stumbling through life. And you think, how? You see, you're in the light. And, and you see people just stumbling through life and making a mess of things. You think, how could, they, how could they not know? Because they're in the dark, spiritual darkness. And they can't see. And I'll tell you, every drop of liquor you take turns the light down. Every bit of drugs you take turns the light down. The more of Hollywood in the world you get into your head turns the light down and darkness comes. Yeah, don't you notice how Hollywood and famous musicians, how vile they are, how perverse they are? They don't have a brain in their head. They can't. They can't keep their marriage. They can't raise their children. They can't stay sober. Big victory. Hollywood star out of the rehab doing well. Well, they shouldn't have been in a rehab. They should have stayed sober. Not enough Sunday school, not enough church. But at some point, you got to make the call yourself. You young people, you got to decide to be the Christian. There's a lot more on here. 
just just tragedy after tragedy. Verse 32, chapter 20, verse 32, Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? And Saul, verse 33, cast a javelin at him to smite him. They should not have let Saul have javelins. I was talking to Pat or Wayne, somebody this morning, and we came up with three small airplane stories with David Gibbs. Three different times he was in tragic plane stories. And one, one of them, I don't know who it said, just don't get in a plane with David Gibbs. <laughs> Tell you what else, don't get around Saul when he's got a javelin. Pass me the salt. I said, pass me the salt. Guy's out of control. Anger. Downward steps. Don't get your way. You throw fits. That's not spiritual. There's nothing good about, there's nothing godly about that. And by the way, it starts when they're 18 months old or younger. Don't, don't you let them. Out of control is out of control. Simple as that. It's like you're not going to make a Volkswagen into a Tesla. It just won't happen. you got to start from the beginning. Saul tried killing his own boy. Flip over to chapter 22. This is, now, now we're going down. I'm going to try real hard to just read the Bible. And not point fingers. Chapter 22, verse 8. Saul has got a bunch of his own people around him in verse 8. And he says, all of you have conspired against me. There's none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with this son of Jesse. That's David. Look at this statement. And there is none of you that is sorry for me. Where? Nobody. Doesn't anybody feel bad for me? Can I say to you young people, that's the culture you're in. You are in this wham, poor me, ain't nobody. You know what? No, we don't care. Well, maybe a little. Verse 13. And Saul said unto him, there, you got to read the story. One of the priests innocently helped David, had no idea what was going on. Saul finds out about it through one of his corrupt people. Verse 13, Saul said, Why have you conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him that he should rise against me to lie and, and wait as in this day? Now let me explain. If we don't go any further, I don't know how much further I'm going to go with this. But there's several things happen here. David comes to a high tub. He's the, he's the priest. Come to the high tub, says, I've got some special secret business from the king. That's called lying. You got to see all the stories where people lie. But anyway, um, do you have any bread? So he got bread. And he said, I got here without my sword. Do you have a sword? He said, the only sword we've got here is Goliath. And David said, that'll do. Man, that's quite the sword. He said, there's no sword like that. And he left. Sword and bread. That's all. Now look what, look what Saul accuses him of. In verse 13, where have you conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, thou hast given him bread? That's true. And a sword, that's true. Now, this is how the devil works. You can see it on news, social media, podcasts. You can see it anywhere you want to go. That's, they take a little bit of truth. Now, watch. And has inquired of God for him. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. But that he should rise against me. David's running from Saul. David never tried to hurt Saul. But see, the devil's always taking a couple of facts and twisting it. And you be very careful what you believe. You'll hear something and, and you think, well, that sounds about right. And then they pile on all this lie on top of it. Don't be so foolish as to believe all this junk that's thrown at good people. It should rise against me to lie to me this day. Oh, what a mess. And, and Saul had all those people killed. All those innocent people. Verse 17, 18. He just killed them all. David, of course, God took care of David. And we can't go through any more here. Let me just, just wrap this up. The way, the way that we got some of the things that I will not even talk about in front of young people. The John Wayne Gacy's. The Saddam Hussein's. The evil people of this world that dismember and maim and torture and torment they're all down here in the darkness. They didn't get there overnight. You see, that was the true light, John 1 says, 
that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That doesn't mean they're saved. That means everybody's got this little touch of God. He says God gave to every man the measure of faith. It's whether you're going to put it in Christ or not. You have a conscience. Everybody's got this little, little bit of light. And if you walk in the light, you get a little more and get a little more. Go through and study children in the Bible. I've got a pamphlet or a Bible study or sermon. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it yet. Right now, it's, it's, it, it's a politically incorrect to the extreme. But you study children in the Bible. You children, you are making your decisions. God, wa- God knows children. You decide, boys and girls, to walk in the light. And you decide to do the right thing. And parents, it is our job to train and to teach But if you start walking away from the light into darkness, how great is that darkness? You don't want to get there. You talk to our people in law enforcement. You talk to our people in the military. The darkness in this world is a darkness like Pharaoh said that you could feel. So evil. You're going one way or another. And I want us to walk in the light. That's, America is turning the light down. Or rather, we're walking away from the light and God's turning the light down. How, how, did, how did our country get this vile? Because we're walking away from the light. We better pray for our country. We better pray for the churches in America. We better pray for bus ministries and Sunday schools. And you teachers, you have no idea how important you are to teach the word of God, to bring light to a dark world. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight. Thank you for being so good to us. What a great God. And I thank you for these people. They're here on purpose. And and this is the crowd that's wanting to walk in the light. And uh, I pray for wisdom for them. Help them, especially those that are parents in a a corrupt world trying to raise good kids. Uh, Bless them guide them help them to make good choices what to and not to allow where to go where not to go all the decisions parents have got to make please give them strength uh, to put their foot down to make sure that things are right bless them we pray bless our church we pray for our country you'd uh, help our our nation's christians to turn to right that you might give us a little light here in jesus name amen let's stand together for a moment with our heads bowed